2012, it's been pretty steady. It's delivered about 19% of all the electricity used in Great Britain in both of those years. If you look at uh, coal plants, this is Drax, the biggest one in the UK, with about nearly 4,000 megawatts of capacity. Um, it's actually proportion of electricity delivered has risen from 30 to 39% over those two years. If we look at the third one, that is the gas plants, um, I put here that it's down from 40% to 28% over those two years. This is all data from uh, DEFRA, from DEC, Department of Energy and Climate Change. The gas power stations are, of course, very interesting in terms of the future of our energy supplies. They're, they come in two forms. This is called a combined cycle gas turbine plant. It's the mo most modern we've got. It was opened last year in Pembrokeshire. And as you can see, it consists of five buildings on the top right there, each of which has got a big thing like a jet engine in it, which is shown on the bottom left. And each of those is 400 megawatts capacity, so it's 2,000 megawatt station. Um, I'm sure Professor Hughes would in fact be mentioning gas and the role of gas in terms of keeping costs down <coughs> and the economy of what we're doing later on. Uh, I will only make one point here on cost, that to build that plant, RWEN Power spent about a, million, a billion pounds and they built it in three years. To produce the same amount of electricity from wind turbines, you need to spend three and a half billion pounds and they would only produce electricity when the wind moves. So you lose both ways, seven times, the, uh, three and a half times the cost and not guaranteed supply of electricity. Now, how do these gas turbine plants work? Well, before I go on to that, um, I just, this, this came out just this week and you might ask the question, well, why has the balance shifted uh, from, uh, from nuclear and coal and gas to coal? The answer is quite simply contained in this. This is data from Blomberg's magazine last week. In Germany, coal uh, prices have gone up from 30 to 30, uh, ours have gone up, sorry, 30 to 39 percent, and gas has gone down from 40 to 28 percent. Coal generation, according to Blomberg, now comes with a 9.6 euros profit per megawatt hour generated, whereas the use of gas in Germany leads to a 19.31 euros loss in profit. And so quite clearly, any company that has to stay in business is not going to be burning gas for very long. And hence, we've got the move towards coal generation in, in Germany. How does the gas plant actually work then? Just so, so that this is a question really of, so you, you, you understand what we're talking about. Here you've got a diagram of a combined cycle gas turbine uh, generator. You can see in the top here, in yellow, you've got natural gas being fed in at the top there and burned in the combustion chamber and that turns turbine blades and turns an electric generator which produces electricity. Now the big point about this type is that the hot <coughs> gases escaping from it, which of course are very hot, are passed through a heat exchanger which is then used to boil water and the steam is used in the lower part to pass through a steam generator and turn another turbine. So basically you've captured the hot exhaust gases and used it a second time to produce yet more electricity. So hence the word combined cycle. And that's a very efficient system, but it does actually mean, of course, that uh, it's not easy to get it running quickly because you've got to get the heat exchanger extracting heat before the whole thing can operate in a combined cycle mode. It's a very efficient also in CO2 emissions terms, 0.3 um, tonnes per megawatt compared to coal, which is about 0.9 tonnes per megawatt. So that is the balance of what the national grid is actually using. And this is a very, very simplistic diagram. The black lines are the national grid, the main high voltage power lines. And it can draw on any of those power stations, the coal, the gas, and the nuclear, at any time it wants to by contract negotiations, as we'll see in a moment. And it can do so on demand. The whole point being, as I said on the right-hand side there, that supply has to be balanced with demand at all times. 
So going on, that, that is the question of dispatchable capacity. In terms of predictability, um, I'd like you just to look at these graphs. The lower graph here is a year. So that's the whole year. And you can see that what you've effectively got there is a sine wave. You can draw through all those, this sine wave. And this is the high demand period of winter. This is the low demand period in the summer. Um, the ups and downs, the blue lines, are weeks. So there's 52 of those ups and downs. And you can see that it's very predictable. You can draw that sine wave through that set of curves and it's virtually the same year to year. So in terms of predictability, we as a society are very predictable. And if you look at the one single week of that, which I've pulled out up in this top graph, you can see that we are, <coughs> this is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and the two lower ones are Saturday and Sunday, when there's a reduced demand. And again, that is reflected all the way through the year, with one or two hiccups at play times like Christmas and things like that. But it's very predictable. So the grid know how we behave, and they can therefore plan forward in terms of providing what we need. Now you could ask, well, what about abnormal surges in demand? And there certainly are some abnormal surges in demand. For example, um, a couple of them, just to show you, the top one is the highest demand that was ever surveyed, that was ever noted, was the semi-final England versus Germany in 1990, when after the, uh, the, the penalty shootout at the end, there was a surge of nearly three gigawatts of power, which is two to three power stations worth. And of course, the grid has to be able to cover, to, cover for that. The most recent was Kate and William's wedding, when there was a surge of 2,400 megawatts. But of course, using a knowledge of events coming forward and weather forecasting, the grid can still be very much in charge of those peaks and troughs. This is just the top one. If you look at this, this is the Germany grid. Here's the half-time surge. That's the full-time surge. There's the penalty shootout. And then there's a huge rise of 2.8 gigawatts uh, when the penalty shootout was over. Now, it has to manage these peaks somehow, uh, because otherwise the system would collapse. And of course, you all know, probably, I'm sure most of you anyway, that they do this by a couple of means. One is pump storage, which means um, using water high up in the mountains. There are four systems like this in Britain, or one of which is in Scotland, then Kraken. And you've got Loch Orr way down here in the valley. It catches water from the surrounding hills, but when the electricity is very cheap at night, it pumps water up into that reservoir, and then it just sits there until the grid contacts it. And it quite literally can contact it and come on stream very quickly. If the turbine in the turbine hall down here is actually already operating, then it can actually be up to full power in 30 seconds, having got a, an instruction from the National Grid Control Office. If it's not spinning, it takes two minutes, but it's still a pretty rapid response. So it can really be triggered by an event such as putting on <coughs> those kettles. The other recourse that the grid has is to use open cycle gas turbines instead of that. And open cycle gas turbines are very similar to the combined cycle, except that the whole lower half, this is the same slide, I've just cut the bottom off, they don't capture the hot gases, so they're just exhausted to atmosphere, which means they're very inefficient, they've got much higher uh, emissions, they use about twice the amount of gas to produce the same amount of electricity as a combined cycle gas turbine plant. But nevertheless, they can reach their full power output in two minutes to 30 minutes, depending on their state of readiness. So the grid can also pull in plants like that to deal with um, the sudden surges in power. So what I've covered now then is dispatchable capacity, and we are predictable, and the, get, the grid can be predictable. In terms of the next step, it has to put forward plan. This is a picture of the control room in Wokingham that covers the whole of Britain. It's a very, very highly computerised uh, centre and it's in touch with all of the um, power stations in the UK continuously and some of the larger wind farms. And literally by telephone and by email. 
And from there, they're, of course, knowing the way in which uh, the peak demand for electricity occurs, whether it be a very high peak in winter or a typical summer's day, depending on where you are, they can budget, if you like, negotiate for the amount of electricity that's needed at any one time. The next slide looks a bit complicated, but it's a, a slide actually from the National Grid, which explains how they do this. And you'll note here, 24 hours, there's a dotted line, anything before the 24 hour point, in other words, tomorrow at 10.20 is being negotiated now, you've got a kind of an open trading, almost like a stock market. You've got supplies of electricity, offering electricity at various prices. There's an open market uh, of trading of electricity. After the 24 hour point, you have to start exchanging contracts. So the grid actually wants to know which suppliers can supply what amount of electricity and when. And actually, that takes place up to a one hour point, which is called the gate closure. Gate closure means basically the contracting is finished and they should then have their no the knowledge of where their supply is coming for one hour in the future. And then there's some fine balancing goes on and then right at the very end, if there's any imbalances, they have to call in the extra bits and pieces to just top the balancing up. So that's the way they do it. It's called the whole process called gate closure. <coughs> so, and if you look at what is contributing at any one time, this is the kind of thing you see. This is about, I think, a four-month period. You, the pale band at the bottom is nuclear power, and you can see that's running the whole time, uh, pretty much constant, constantly. The pale blue above it is gas, and apart from some peaks and troughs, which do slightly mirror the troughs in the black area, is pretty constant. And then the black area at the top is coal plants. And what you can see immediately is that most of the load following where the peaks and troughs are is provided by coal. It's coal output that's going up and down, mostly, compared to gas and compared to nuclear. And that's, in fact, the way it is. Now, what if something actually goes wrong, uh, things do go wrong in complicated systems like the national grid. But one of the um, examples which I'll show you, again it looks a bit complicated but I'll take you through it, this actually happened, this is all documented in the literature, it happened in December 2002 and it, this is a real life situation. In uh, the 4th of December the national grid had nearly 3 gigawatts of spare power this black line, is, if you like, is the balance point. So they were well in surplus. And then on the 5th, let's go to my pointer. Yes, on the 5th, they had a problem with Dungeness B nuclear power station. It developed a fault on one of its turbines and it had to be closed down. So they lost some of their spare capacity. That's that, that little bit up here. A couple of days later, they had a problem, what well, demand went up. There was an, in, a very, very sharp de decrease in temperatures, in weather, and the demand forecast went up. And so their spare capacity fell again. And that was okay until here, when they had a problem with Middle Ferry, another power station, which had a fault. And that fell again. Then we were steady, but then there was a combination of demand up again, and several other power plants experiencing problems. And at that point here, around about the 9th, they had a fall which took them below the balance point. So they were then in a situation of imminent lights going off and plant closures. Um, the rest is a bit complicated, but it's a combination of plants failing and plants coming in. And they just about managed to keep it hovering around the balance point until suddenly, at the end of this scale, the weather suddenly warmed up, demand dropped off, and they, they were pulled out of, fat was pulled out of the fire. So, and I, one thing I'd like you to notice that here, uh, the cost of electricity in the 2002 was about 26 pounds a megawatt hour. Here, right at the end, when they pulled in, when they pulled in Littlebrook Reserve, they paid £10,000 per megawatt hour. And that's because that power station was actually effectively mothballed 
and the company had to bring in staff, get, run it up and get it going. And so, of course, they could literally charge what they like. And that is a fact of uh, power provision. It changes throughout the um, period of time. Okay, so that's the way the, the grid works. Gate closure, spinning, reserve and contracting, standby, phase call-in of additional uh, generators if necessary. They could then issue an NIM, you've seen it on the last slide, a notice of insufficient margins, which means it's critical. And then, if necessary, termination of supply to industrial customers first. In the last few months, we've heard that, in fact, the government is quietly building a lot of diesel generators like this. Um, and it's been reported in the press that these could be used to back up wind because these are all being connected to the national grid's central control room. However, sources in the industry say that they will not be used, in fact, to back up wind. Whether one believes them, I don't know. But they are really there because a hospital, a military installation, uh, schools, uh, that sort of thing cannot be without power. Uh, anyway, that's something we didn't know about when I spoke uh, last May. Now, what about the performance of the wind carpet? This will be much more familiar territory to most of you, and I won't go into this in any great depth. Simply to point out, this is a map of wind speeds across Britain issued by the uh, UK Climate Impacts Programme. And you can see that the whole of England is pretty blue. And the speeds, in fact, correspond to about anything up to about 10 or 11, 12 miles an hour. Scotland, you can see, is very much more yellow. No, my point is not going to survive, I don't think. No, I'll have to speak without it. But anyway, the um, no. Scotland, as you can see, there's far more yellow colours at the top there because it's a much higher average wind speed in Scotland. But nevertheless, if you plot out the wind speeds on average throughout Britain, it looks like this. The green curve is the average wind speeds and the axis on the left is the number of days per year that you get that wind speed. And you can see that the commonest wind speeds in Britain is in fact um, between 10 and 12 miles per hour. That first vertical white line. The power curve of a wind turbine is shown in red and you can see they don't start generating until around about 10 miles, 12 miles an hour. And then they gradually increase in output until 30 miles an hour when they're on full power. And those two curves simply don't fit. So our wind speed profile doesn't fit a turbine's generator profile. And for that reason, I mean, you can never reconcile the problem of uh, intermittency of wind not being available. In fact, as I show right at the top there, up to 100 days a year, in most average wind farms, there'll be no output and about another 105 days a year, there'll be less than 50% output. So it is incredibly um, difficult to integrate that into a, what is a highly integrated system. Weather charts, I won't say much because they're very familiar to you. You can see here that, uh, that that's a weather front going across Britain, 21st, 22nd, 25th. And as you can see on the bottom graph, when it's the isobars are very open on the 21st, there's very little wind. When it's, they're very close together, the wind electricity output rises sharply. And of course the problem is these, these large fronts often cross the whole of Europe. And this idea that there's always somewhere windy is, is fairly flawed, although there may be a small element of truth in it. If we look at the situation, in, and this is a slide from Denmark, you can see the red dots at the top are peaks when the whole of the Danish wind farm carpet was virtually operating full out. And there's about, uh, what have I said, 13 of them. But during that same year, the blue dots show the peak, the, the troughs, when there was less than uh, 100 <coughs> megawatts on the day. So you've got an incredibly stochastic or random output of wind. This is a slide from uh, the, uh, Jeremy might use, I don't know, he did last time, I think. It shows the scatter of uh, output of wind in percentage terms up on the left axis, up to 100, I think. And then you've got the, the days, I think that's a four month period. But the basic thing that this is pointing out is the almost random scatter of dots 
all over that. There's no real pattern emerges. And the problem is, when we get periods of low wind uh, in Britain, it's usually in the winter coincides with uh, very cold spells. And you can see at the bottom, at the far right and the far left, you've got an ambient temperature of one to two degrees centigrade, whereas at the peak right up there, it was 10.3 degrees centigrade. So low wind means low temperature, means little output of electricity when you most need it. So coming back then, can uh, wind actually contribute to baseload and peaking power? Well, this slide you saw earlier, except I've added two more in yellow bits to it. The bottom left is we now have, dis dis we had dispatchable supplies in 1980 and adequate margins, whereas today, we've moved to non-dispatchable, increasingly non-dispatchable supplies from renewables and inadequate margins by most people's calculations. So can this provide uh, peak uh, baseload provision? Uh, this is a graph from EON's wind report in 2005, and they certainly thought that they couldn't. In fact, as the wind carpet increases, the percentage that can be provided uh, to replace traditional generation declines, as you can see on this graph. In terms of load following power and peaking power, um, we've just seen from those graphs of the output of wind that it's so variable uh, that there are large periods of the year when it doesn't produce anything. I'll just use the example of houses supplied, which the wind farm is very fond of saying how many houses supplied. In yellow now, I've added the curve of houses supplied to that previous graph that you saw. And in yellow, you can see that for the first part, up to the first vertical white line, you've got no houses supplied at all because the wind, from the wind farm because there's no generation. Then you've got an increasing proportion, which rises, obviously, as the wind power in, reaches its maximum. We have, however, one other issue which is related to forward planning, and that is the government's role, whether it be the Scottish Government or Westminster Government, a failure, in fact, uh, in, to really strategically plan our needs. And just to show you, this is a slide I was given by Richard Mason from British Nuclear Fuels Limited in 2002, and this shows the closure of the nuclear plants in Britain. As you can see, each step down is the closure of a plant. This was known 15 years ago that this was going to happen. And the next slide is a slide I drew in 2003 when I spoke to a meeting. And it shows, it uses that data from B British Nuclear Fuels, but it also loses, uses the data from the Large Combustion Plants Directive, which said coal fire stations had to close unless they could remove sulfur dioxide from their flues, and that's happening now. If you add those closures together, you get the lines, the black line at the bottom there, and that is from 2002 to 2025. The top line is the rising demand of electricity, which the government thought you would get. In fact, demand hasn't risen quite that much because of the recession, but nevertheless, at the end of it, we're left with a potential shortfall of something like 50%. I say they're 64%, but it isn't that high because of the decreased demand. And this process of closures is still going on. This is just a table of recent uh, projected closures, Didcot, Tilbury, Ironbridge, Kings, North Ferry Bridge, coal-fired power stations and some oil power stations. Whereas the Germans, as you can see at the bottom, are building 10 new hard coal-fired plants, a total of 7,900 megawatts, one of which opened this week, the very first one opened this week on its trials. So they're burning hard coal, we're closing coal. Uh, that could be, the reason could be that they're fitting flue desulfurization, getting rid of the sulfur from their emissions of those, but it makes you wonder why we're not uh, addressing that problem as well. So diagrammatically, here is the closure of our uh, station on the left, nuclear coal and gas, plenty of spare capacity in 2010, a little bit of wind on the system. Here, here you've got the wind on the system. Yes, I'm just, just wrapping up, yep. Uh, 10 gigawatts of wind in 2015, 
but then by 2020 there's a projected 36 gigawatts of wind which in fact uh, is going to cause us all kinds of problems particularly uh, if it isn't windy we will not have sufficient capacity so a number of people have actually said we'll need a very large construction of new power stations I won't go through these because uh, I'm running out of time um, but it has also been noted by people like Hugh Sharman that we shouldn't in fact have more than 10 gigawatts of wind in the system if we're going to manage it successfully. The energy regulator has warned over blackouts. We know that they've suggested a 1 in 12 chance of blackouts. The same things have been reported by the National Grid in its winter outlook and also in the newspapers. This is a quote of Jeremy Nicholson here, who will be speaking in a moment. Uh, I couldn't find a better one, I used this uh, last May. Um, wind energy is fundamentally insecure. It is delusional to the point of recklessness to assume it will ever meet 30% of the UK electricity consumption with an acceptable level of reliability. As events in winter show, nearly all of its generating capacity needs to be backed up by fossil fuel stations. The more wind we have on the system, the greater the problems will be. For the wind lobby, and I've had it in, and for our politicians to fail to acknowledge this, is intellectually dishonest. So finally, uh, cartoonists often get the hit the nail on the head. Um, this is a cartoon about dispatchability. This is a cartoon, I've altered the name of the car from uh, an Australian make to Salmon, the Salmon Green Energy Four Door Saloon, which has to tow uh, a fossil fuel backup car with it. So, in conclusion, the answer to the question is that, in fact, our present, we, with our present technology base, wind has only a marginal role in base load, no role in load following. It poses major problems for the grid and all of potential crippling costs to our whole nation and our economy and our well-being. So if I was in your position, I'd do my own forward planning. So thank you very much indeed. Yeah. <laughs>